If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and, his, and in His word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen in the morning, more than watchmen for the morning. Lord, help us that if we are like Peter and we've walked out strong, but now the waves look big. Now the things of this world seems to overwhelm. Help us to remember that you walked on top of those waves. They never caused any fear to you. They were never any trouble to you. And all you asked of Peter said is, look at me, have faith. And so Lord, help us not to hide in the boat. Help us not to run away when things happen. But that we walk in faith and love and hope and joy. Because you are still in charge. And all things work together for good. For those who love the Lord and are called according to His purposes. The Lord speak to us again today. And not just words that we remember and words that make us think. But words that change us. Holy Spirit, we pray that you will take your words and change us from the inside out. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. The last couple of weeks we've been on a journey which is our theme for the year and that is about walking in love. And if you're a visitor here, I just need to tell you that what we said is that biblical love is not worldly love. It's very different. Worldly love is very selfish. Worldly love is what I can get out of it. Which is why I get divorced when I don't get anything out of it anymore. Because it's not for me anymore. Um, worldly love, love those who love you back. Worldly love, love those who are kind to you. But we are called to something far greater than that. We're called to love our enemies. We are called to love those who are mean to us. Those who are unlovable and unkind. And it's hard. It's really hard. I, I've really been... Blessed by how many of you have come back to me and saying, Man, it's hard, but I want to do it. This is who I want to be. Because it's not just hard, it's possible. Not in our own strength, but in the power of God it is possible. And like I said, it's been so lovely for me that people came and said, They, they always had this idea that, you know what, I'm a Christian, I'm quite loving. But to be challenged with this passage, it's like, But am I patient? Am I kind? Do I forgive people? Um, that's the test for good biblical love. I think in the midst of all of this, like we've just spoken about, we've been very distracted by the coronavirus. Um, but we must remember, just like Martin Luther did, that every crisis is an opportunity to show God's love. Every crisis opens a door that has never been opened before. I remember when we were, when we were studying, um, there was a time when they had the massive tsunami in the east, and Sri Lanka had a lot of damage. And one of my friends who studied with me joined a group that went there to help people dig wells and put up these things. And they went into areas where Christians have never, ever been allowed to go. Never, ever. Now God brings a crisis. And we can have a couple of responses. Yeah, shows you. You are mean anti-Christians. God got you now. Or we could say, oh, thank goodness it didn't happen to me. Or we can say, how can I love? How can I show the love of God in the midst of this? And the more coronavirus spreads, the more we're going to be able to ask that question. How does this allow me to love more? How does this allow me to show the love of God more? Um, so we are going to read the same passage we've been reading and we're finishing off with that passage today. So I'm going to ask Erika, you can come and we're going to read Colossians 3 from verse 12 to 14. Colossians 3 verse 12 to 14. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. 
Thank you. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word is power. But the power lies in coming, hearing, understanding, and obeying. So, Lord, help us to obey. Lord, we don't want to go through this year and learn about love and remain unchanged and remain impatient and unforgiving and hard and harsh. Let your spirit guide us in how we love. We pray this all, Lord, in your wonderful name. Amen. The, the passage we're going to look at today is that last verse in verse 14 that says, And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. So he's, he's pulling all these things together. He says, you know what? Patience and forgiveness and being kind, it all works. It all happens. It all starts coming together when you pull them together in love. In other words, I have to daily ask myself, do I love that person like God wants me to love them? And if I focus on that and, and, and bring that as the thing that brings harmony, these things become possible. These things become the way I live. And again, let's put names there. Do I love my mother-in-law? Do I love my ex-spouse? Do I love the person that harmed my child? Do I love my boss, who's an old big meanie? Asking these questions, this isn't selective love, this is love for everyone. But everything I've said to love, I know some of you might be here and thinking, okay, Carl J., you know, love is all good and well, but when do we get to the spiritual things and the more mature things? When do we get to the things that really make church exciting? Um, well, that is a very interesting question. And my f response question w to that would be, well, what do you see as the, the most spiritual experiences? Um, is, it, is it tongues? Speaking in tongues? Is it healing? Are you, get, let's just move love out of the way, but let's get to the important things. Let's get some healings going. What about miracles? Or prophecy? Or visions? What, what's the most spiritual experience? What about angels visiting us while we're here? What about a visit from the Pope? Man, for some people, that's the ultimate spiritual experience. I remember we had a, a, a family member in Renee's family who, who wasn't a Christian at all, but whenever the Pope was on TV... Man, she was there sitting in front of the TV, looking at God's holy man. Um, what is your most spiritual experience? Maybe for you it's a great gospel music event. We were there with thousands of people worshipping God. Um, but let's talk about that today. Let's ask the question, what is the most spiritual experience that we can have? And the first question we have to ask about this question is, how do we decide what is the most spiritual experience? Is it what feels most spiritual to me? In other words, man, I walked away from that service, oh, and I could just feel the spirit was moving. Is it what looks most spiritual? So like, oh, you know, things happened today. There were gold dust falling from the sky, and, and, and there were weird sounds that looked very spiritual to me. Was it the thing that impressed outsiders most? Um... Was it maybe what my tradition said is the most spiritual? Well, we don't have those options. To go there to find out what is the most spiritual, we have to look at the Bible. We'll have to look at God's Word and ask God, God, we would love to have the most spiritual experience when we gather together. What is that? What is the thing that when that happens, we say, we've met with God. We've met with God today. And I, and I hope to show you that the most amazing, the most mature, the most spiritual, the most life-changing experience you can have that's a spiritual experience is love. It's love. Firstly, God's love for us. When you get that, when you're living your own life and you do your own thing, and you love for what makes you happy, and you realize, but I'm not happy. I'm miserable. And you do the things that make you miserable more, as if you think it's going to make things better. You sleep around more, or you drink more, 
or you get more money and you're thinking, why is this not getting any better? And then one day your eye opens. There's a God who says it can be different. There's a God who says, turn and come to me and I will give you rest. That's the, that's the most spiritual experience. And, and the second part of that experience, spiritual experience is if it becomes evident and visible and active among the people of God. Um, I know for some it's, it's not, it's, they don't want to hear that. They want to hear, let's do love and then move on to the important things. Um, and I'm not saying those other things are unimportant or wrong. I'm not saying tongues with interpretation and miracles and healings are wrong or bad. I think a visit from the Pope we can call as a bad thing. But all the other ones, I think, make sense. But there's a great danger for us that when we make the second most important thing, the most important thing, we miss the point. If we take the thing that God says, it's good, but don't, this is not your main goal. If we start making that our main goal, we miss the bus. Um, say for instance, to use an example, you now have a car and you have to drive somewhere and you decide, my main goal in driving this car is to have the best fuel efficiency. And then someone says, well, just go there. Oh, I can't, it's uphill. I don't do uphill. Uphill is bad for fuel efficiency. I can't, point me, I'll go downhill anyway, but don't point me uphill. You're going to go, you're silly. Does that mean fuel efficiency is a bad thing? No. But the moment you make it the most important thing, you miss the goal. Or what if you say, well, I'm going to go to school, and my main goal in, making, in school is going to be to make friends. I want to make good friends. Now, is it a bad thing to make friends? Of course not. But if I make making friends my main goal, I might never do my homework. Because I'm going to spend all my time looking for friends and spending time on my friends. And the same in church. If my main goal is that we should start speaking in tongues, I miss the point. If my main goal is that I, I want to see healings, I want to see miracles, we miss the point. We miss the primary goal. And our goal should be biblical love. Now obviously you shouldn't just take my word for it. Let's look at God's word and, and see whether what I say, said is true. The first one is from 1 Corinthians 12, 31 to 13.3. A chapter talking about all these wonderful things like tongues and healing and prophecy. And it says, but earnestly desire the higher gifts. So even in the gift he's saying, in the context he has, stop focusing on tongues. They are more important gifts. But now he's saying, there's something even more important than gifts. And I will show you a still more excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love. I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Does that sink in? God says, if I walk in here and I'm impatient to that guy who did me harm, and then I come stand here in front and speak in tongues, God says, stop making that noise. Stop making noises in my gathering. And if I have prophetic powers, and understand all mysteries and all knowledge. And if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. I mean, imagine someone like that rises up in the church. Spiritual powers to know things and to prophesy. And yet they think so much of themselves that they are not, they're not humble. They don't forgive. God looks at that guy and says, you are nothing. If I give away all I have, because some people experience that as the most spiritual experience. It's just so, it moves me and I can give away things and make people feel good. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver my, up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. I think we can end here. That says it quite powerfully enough. But let's look at some other passages. Galatians 5.22 speaks about the fruit of the Spirit. In other words, what becomes visible when the Spirit is working in me? And what's the first thing on the list? Love. Let's look at Romans 5.5. 5, that talks about what happens when the Spirit is poured into my life. 
And hope does not put us to shame. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You know, there are many other examples. If you look at Pentecost, that came with fantastic miracles and fantastic tongues. And if you follow the line, they had miracles. Sometimes. They had tongues. Sometimes. But what did they have all the time? Gathering together in love. Community. Caring for each other. Focusing on the love of God through the teaching of the apostles. Through prayers, through the breaking of bread. And so what are we saying? We are saying, if I want in my love life the most spiritual experience I can ever have, I need to, take, need to start taking love seriously. If I want to walk in the power of the Spirit, I need to take love seriously. Godly love, not worldly love. Godly love. Um, and you know what? I have a suspicion that if we start there, the other things will follow. If we start with love, I think healings will happen more. I think if we start with love, all these things about prophecies and that will become more powerful because they will be done on the right basis. So in conclusion, the biggest question you need to ask yourself here today is, have I responded to God's love? Because if not, it means less than nothing. If I stand here today and you know what, I might call myself a Christian, I might remember past events when I was quite Christianly, I might know the Bible very well, but if God had to appear today and stand in front of me and say, do you love me? I would have to go, no, I love the world. I love me. I love the things of the world. God says, have you given your life to me? I'd have to, that, I might have to be honest and say, no, I gave some of it to you, but I wanted to have control over the rest. God's invitation is, you're a sinner. You are heading to hell. That's the only place you deserve to go. But I don't want it to be like that. So I sent my son to die on the cross to pay for your sins. That doesn't automatically get you into eternity. I now have to accept that love. What does John says? For all who received him, I have to say, God, grab hold of me. God, I want to turn my back on this old life. This is not who I want to be. Please forgive me. Please make me new. And in that, if you mean it, and if you come with the right heart, with the right attitude of leaving it all behind, God makes you new. He forgives you. And you become his child. And what happens then? His love is poured into your heart through the Holy Spirit. So you might stand there and think, but it will never be that person. I will never be able to forgive them. You don't know what they did to me. And then the love of God is poured into your heart and you say, oh, I've been forgiven so much. How can I not forgive that person? How can I not treat that person with kindness even when they repay my kindness with evil? If I get the love of God, I can give it to others. So the first question here for you today, and this is an individual question, are you a child of God? Are you a follower of Jesus? And the second question is, which type of life do you want with God? Do you want this idea where, yeah, God is there, he's like my spare wheel, if I'm really in an emergency, I can run there, I can use him. Or well, God is like the hospital, I hope never to go there, but man, at least when I get sick, I have somewhere to go to. Or is God your life? Maybe you just want a traditional Christianity. Traditional Christianity. You want to come and sit here, and you want to know what songs we're singing, and you want to know that the pastor's not going to preach longer than 20 minutes, and I don't want to talk to anyone. Please don't offer me tea. I want to get home and watch the rugby. Um, soon all rugby will be cancelled. You've got nothing else to do. So... Maybe God is forcing you to talk to the guy next to you and to make things right with the people that you haven't made things right with. What type of love, life do you want to have? Do you want to have that dead, worldly, that sometimes Christianity is good, but then I fall away again, and for a while I'm away, then I come again and it's a little bit good? Or do you want life, life abundantly? 
Do you want to walk spiritually with God? Do you want to experience the power of Christ in your heart? Then walk in love. Then walk in love. You know, there's a very famous verse that we often quote from Second Peter. Second Timothy, sorry. It says this. We, we read this part that says, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. So we say, you know there are Christians who have the appearance of godliness. So they might dress like a Christian, and especially on Sundays they talk like a Christian, and they do Christian things, but there's no power. There's no power in them to deal with their sin. There's no power in them to, to deal with other people well. There's no power in them to get up and do the things that they need to do. They are nominal dead Christians. And that's bad. But do you see the context here? When he talks about those people, he says, but understand this. I'm going to show you how many times he mentions love. But understand this, that in the last days, there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, never have enough, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. What is the context of someone that doesn't have power in God? Someone who doesn't have the love of God. What's the context of someone who's um, a dead Christian? The context of someone who loves the world more than God. 